What's up friends, it's Endymion, and there has been a new challenger entering the culture war battle and things are heating up. Beyond this, Square Enix has officially come forward with more information following the fallout of their previous announcements. And the hypocrisy of studios pandering while not being truthful in their own conviction gets exposed, but to begin, there's a game called No Rest for the Wicked. It's currently in early access on PC right now. The game is made by Moon Studios, the same dev that made stuff like Ori and the Blind Forest. The CEO behind this developer has taken a stand against cancel culture, and things are getting wild because of it. From that park place, we have this article titled No Rest for the Wicked CEO Thomas Mahler rebukes game journalists and defends gamers fighting back against woke ideology. As you can expect, Thomas Mahler here has decided to stand up for the common player and the backlash has been getting pretty nuclear to say the least. This all started because Thomas decided to push back against a German games journalist whose name is Maurice Weber. Apparently Maurice, who works for a German games news outlet called GameStar, reached out to Thomas for an upcoming article they're writing for the website. And likely, whatever this article is about, it got Thomas heated as hell because he took to Twitter to respond with his full thoughts. My guess would be that whatever this Maurice Weber is writing for GameStar, it would paint Thomas and Moon Studios in a negative light. Because according to Thomas, his studio does not subscribe to the identity political angle that many other Western studios do. And likely Maurice was going to crucify him for not getting in line but instead having his own opinions. Thomas had a lot to say on this and I quote, I already know I might get myself into trouble once again by posting this but I just replied to Maurice Weber, a German journalist who is affiliated with the German outlet GameStar. I do think it's especially important these days that we always remind ourselves to try to keep an open mind and to try to understand even those who think differently than we do. To interject here quickly between the quote, Thomas then shifted what he was saying to a long message that he sent to GameStar's Maurice Weber. So the rest of this statement is what Thomas sent to GameStar. Alright, and I quote again. I think it all makes sense, Maurice. This is basically a backlash against cancel culture and similar phenomena because everyone has had enough of that nonsense. I'd suggest you take a more nuanced view, especially since you position yourself as a journalist. Yet you often display a narrow-minded attitude and don't seem to question what's actually going on and that is something we should expect from a journalist. Just because you personally haven't been affected by cancel culture doesn't mean there hasn't been a lot of foolishness happening. And it's still ongoing and it's only a matter of time before it impacts you too. Consider this famous statement, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trained unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trained unionist. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. Instead of allowing artists to just be artists, Hollywood and most of the game developers on the west coast have decided that it's appropriate to use films and video games as platforms to push their own political agenda. If you argue otherwise, I would expect a journalist like you to back it up with thorough research, moreover, it's become the norm to point fingers at others, particularly at those who may think differently from us. Rather than allowing others to be different and listening to them regardless, we attack them outright. It's frankly eerily reminiscent of old Yahtzee tactics. Anyone who doesn't conform is ridiculed and it's suggested they be shamed, fired, and have their careers destroyed. This has been the approach over the past few years and I know plenty of people whose careers have been devastated by trivialities and misinformation and they continue to suffer today. You seem unaffected and thus you refuse to consider a more open perspective. Your apparent lack of empathy in this matter is not only unhelpful but also shows a considerable amount of ignorance. Allow me to also play critic for a moment at GameStar, you do the same thing. Instead of cleaning your own house, you wield the we report and earn from our articles but beware those guys are the real villains narrative. Just to ensure the spotlight never falls on you, aligning yourselves just so. That's precisely why we've cut you off. We find such morally dubious practices unacceptable and refuse to support them. You lack the initiative to conduct your own journalistic investigations as it seems too much work when the next clickbait article is due the next day. The sad thing is that young journalists like yourselves never knew anything else. The more outrage you generate, the more clicks you get, and that's how you make your living. At the expense of others, which apparently doesn't matter as long as you're seen as the good guys. 
I hope in the future you will approach the world with more skepticism and openness and truly consider both sides instead of aligning yourselves with one to amplify their propaganda." End quote. So, as you can see, Moon Studios CEO Thomas Maller went absolutely in on GameStar and called them out for what they are, which in his own words, they are pretty much like every other games journalist outlet ever. They amplify the voices they agree with and then trash the ones who don't bend the knee to their ideology, and honestly, Thomas is right. Like he says, the entire industry has become an echo chamber where only right think is awarded when it comes to nominations and press coverage. Having any opinion outside of the normal view immediately makes you a target by the cabal of game journalists out there when they smell blood. Frankly, given this massive response by Thomas, I wouldn't be surprised if No Rest for the Wicked ends up getting lower scores when it comes to reviews. And that's not because of the game's quality, but simply because of Thomas' comments. And I can already see at least a paragraph or two of every review from every modern gaming website taking time out of their piece to personally speak about how Thomas Mahler's comments are tone deaf or something. Similar to how pretty much every review of Stellar Blade took time out of their reviews to comment on Eve's sexuality, Thomas is clearly playing with fire here, but in reality, the only thing that may be suffered in the long run for his studios and games are likely going to be media coverage and awards. Because coming out like this and saying, I don't subscribe to your lunacy and I think we need more diversity of thought within games journalism is pretty much sinful in the eyes of the industry. This is how your game ends up not getting nominated for anything like Hogwarts Legacy was also ignored when award season came. It didn't matter that Legacy was the highest selling game of 2023, beating out even Call of Duty. Its existence was rooted in wrong thing thanks to its creator, so naturally the game just didn't exist when it came to award season. Even though the presence of Hogwarts Legacy financially benefited platforms like PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, and PC with the game sales obviously charting very high on their charts, but the game has wrong thing, so it was ignored as if it never existed. But the caveat and saving grace here is that No Rest for the Wicked, assuming Thomas doesn't apologize and bend the knee or anything, will likely get massive support from fans across the world because of his speech here. Because he, unlike many others in similar positions, won't speak out in fear of what that will cause them to suffer through. But according to Grums, that change is happening just silently instead, Grums said via Twitter following this Moon Studio speech. I can tell you there are more studio head CEOs and creative directors who are fed up with what is happening with the games industry and with game journalism. They can't go on record, but they have reached out and let me know and are taking action in their own studios. We are not alone. And I think the insanity bubble is going to burst in the next year or two. It simply cannot continue this way for any longer. It has to be fixed sooner rather than later or the second collapse of modern gaming will absolutely be happening. Of course, following the statement by Moon Studios CEO, weirdly enough, none other than one of CD Projekt Red's own employees responded to his claims, which has turned this whole thing far more interesting than it was originally. Also that Park Place, The Witcher narrative director Philip Weber targets Moon Studios CEO Thomas Maller for calling out cancel culture and defending gamers fighting against woke ideology. So within that very same Twitter post where Thomas said what he said, the Witcher narrative director, which to specify exactly, Philip Weber, is the narrative director of the next mainline Witcher game, which is currently called Codename Polaris. Anyway, this director then replied to Thomas in his thread by saying, I do remember when you were quite happy to publicly shit on us a while ago, so please make sure to apply those principles you ask of others for yourself as well. To which Thomas replied, and I quote, I always try to, feel free to call me out whenever I'm not true to my words. And I was right in the end, wasn't I? It's commendable that you folks turn things around and I love you folks for that. But that doesn't excuse that you sold a full price game while trying to hide the fact that it was broken and untested. And your marketing department tried their best to cover things up. That is just a shady practice and should be condemned whenever it happens. By the way, you work in the AAA industry. I think you're playing with fire by publicly posting like this. You're a cog in a machine that doesn't really care about you, so be careful." End quote. God damn, Thomas here, he's just unloading shots in every direction, but while some may say he's out of line, he's also right too. What Thomas is saying here is that you can virtue signal all you want. The reality is that you will be thrown to the wolves the moment you step out of line which in turn confirms that the reasoning for pushing back against the players by pandering doesn't work and never will technically be rewarded in the long run. 
You can pander all you want. You're just as expendable as anyone else in the eyes of these crazy people. And not only that, but Thomas is also right that CD Projekt Red did sell an unfinished buggy mess of a game when Cyberpunk released. I remember buying the game during the lockdowns and being hyped to play it, and after a few hours, the game was very clearly not finished. Textures didn't work, the roads looked like ass, I genuinely felt so disappointed and I ended up refunding the game an hour or two later. And I was just kind of left there with a hole in my heart, knowing that CD Projekt at the time anyway had fallen and ruined one of the most hyped releases of all time. And while the game was still being attacked by plenty of players, the reviews for the PC version anyway were still glowing. And of course, there was lots of praise of gender preferences and all of that stuff as if anything of that matter considered when the game was already so broken at the time. As one user said, I love Cyberpunk and defended the PC version as a day one buyer, but please, why attack Thomas here when he's completely right? Not only was the initial state of the console versions awful, what he says about cancel culture and the limiting of creative freedom cannot be denied. To which Philip Weber of CD replied, it's not about not acknowledging that, which I think we started by making it right and we have to do in the future by not repeating it. It's about how invoking quotes about the Holocaust while sitting in a glass house is maybe a bit much. I see where Philip is coming from, but to be real with you, this isn't the hill that you want to die on when it comes to things like this. I believe what Thomas said when using the quote invoking World War II imagery to now is technically applicable because it's true. Obviously, neither is Thomas or I saying that what's happening to video games today are in any way, shape, or form as bad as what was happening during World War II. I lost plenty of family on both sides during that war, and the scars of those who lived through it are still living with it today. However, I think what Thomas was trying to apply here by using that terminology is that when the good people do nothing and refuse to speak up, it allows for evil to rise and take over. Which is both true in World War II or any war really, maybe an extreme example, but an example nonetheless. For almost 10 years now since the original Gamergate, the push against the perversion and destruction of video games was mostly just allowed to happen. At first people scoffed at it when presented with concepts like genderless customization systems in games or someone saying they'll report you if you misgender them. But flash forward to today and these things have become the norm and in some countries it's considered hate speech. The pendulum has swung so far in the other direction that there's no rationality when it comes to any sort of conversation surrounding anything remotely politically charged these days. Remember when Az from Heel vs. Babyface said the pronoun thing was stupid in Starfield? And then pretty much the entire internet attacked him only for months later most people now agree that he was right. That there is a deliberate push by studios and publishers to implement as much pandering as humanly possible into everything that gets made. Because it's true, and whenever a game doesn't subscribe to these ideas and goes their own way, the industry attacks them for it. Final Fantasy XVI got blasted by journalists because there wasn't enough diversity and that slavery in the game wasn't as easy to understand because everyone had the same skin color. It didn't register in the journalists' heads because how could slaves be white, like in XVI, even though there's been plenty of slaves in history that were white-skinned? This No Rest for the Wicked game is going to get attacked eventually because the CEO doesn't agree with the mob. And they'll sooner tear him and his studio down before allowing him to have his own opinion for too long. I know a lot of people say please keep politics out of things, but the sad reality is that these days politics has taken over everything to some degree. Nothing is without messaging baked into it anymore. You can't enjoy most things without being told you must think this one way or you're a terrible person. And I think for the gaming industry anyway, whether it's the inflated budgets, lack of sales, and so on, they're realizing that the ways of the industry and the consumer base are changing. Look at multiplayer games. You gotta be insane to be releasing a multiplayer game these days if it's not free to play. Remember when EA tried to sell a multiplayer-only Battlefield 2042 for premium pricing? And then nobody bought it and they had to slash the price like crazy and fix the game in order to have any sort of player base? Back in the early 2010s, multiplayer games being bought for full price was not crazy because it was the norm. But these days, stuff like Fortnite, Apex, and so many others have irreversibly changed that industry forever. And the same can be said about premium price games too. Many of them are failing, even ones I really enjoyed like Final Fantasy XVI and Rebirth, which have both been confirmed to not meet the sales expectations for Square Enix, but in Square's case... It seems like nothing ever meets their expectations. They somehow believe everything they make should be reaching Call of Duty numbers, and then when they don't, they're disappointed. And then circling this back to CD Projekt Red and the debate between CEOs and directors, 
more than ever before, you really need to convince players to want to buy your game at release. Because the reality is, there's so much stuff that's coming out pretty much all the time. And in reality, why would you buy any game at release knowing full well in a month or two it's going to be 30-40% to 40 off anyways? And then there are those out there where hype has no effect on them and they just wait till the game and all its DLC is bundled for cheaper and then they buy it. I know some of you watching are like that and that's crazy to me that hype has no effect on you guys. I wish I was like that too. But to be honest, because the industry is so much coming out all the time, not only is it hard to keep up, but it's not really needed either. And I think a big reason why is simply because everything is too expensive these days. I regularly spend around $400 every beginning of the month buying groceries. Yet when I actually look at what I buy, it's not that much. Then you factor in your phone bill, electricity, water, rent, or mortgage, yada yada yada, it keeps going. And then some game comes out and goes, hey, if you want to play this, it'll cost you $90 Canadian at release. Like you're telling me that one game costs one-fourth my average grocery bill for one game. Really? And most people obviously say, no thanks, I'm good. Now take everything I just said and now your game is pushing politics down your throat and throwing in stuff nobody wants like gender pronouns and whatnot. And then these companies have the audacity to look you straight in the face and say, please buy our slop simulator that either doesn't work at release, is missing content deliberately so that we can sell it to you later on for more, or features moronic woke crap in it for $90 Canadian. Also, if you don't buy it, you're a racist and a bigot. Cool? Thanks. Really making your case that that's something that I want to support. Look, we get it, games are expensive to make. But there has to come a point where the tension of this tug of war is going to snap the rope instead of either side winning. Everything is already too damn expensive. We're also basically in a recession right now and shit takes far too long to make and studios keep closing. It has to change. I love games like Dragon Age and apparently Dreadwolf comes out this year, but dude, look at the timeline. It's been 10 years since the last proper Dragon Age game. 10 goddamn years. If you ask me what would I rather have, wait 10 years for a new installment that is likely a massive game full of content, or every 2-3 to three years I get a smaller game that explores a different part of that world that costs less, isn't 200 hours long in order to justify its price tag, and also respects my time and money. It's an easy solution for me. I would buy and love a smaller Dragon Age Witcher or Mass Effect game. That's maybe like $30 and is a single player game where I get to enjoy a part of the world and have fun. But in the eyes of investors and many players listening to this right now, they'd rather have the bloated 200 hour experience instead. And this shit is just not sustainable at all, it just isn't. Thomas Mahler of Moon Studios continues by saying, I do think it was appropriate since the more extreme folks on both sides use rhetoric that I honestly didn't think I'd see again in my lifetime. To which the Witcher narrative director then responds, I agree that it's become impossible to even have a conversation, but I feel going extreme like that doesn't help anything. It just makes all sides more extreme, as if there is no in-between left, and even Weber is right here too, everything has gone off the deep end. There's no nuance to a lot of this anymore, it's either you're with us or against us, you can't have a conversation with people you disagree with, because of the simple fact that you have opposing points, which means immediately those against you are the enemy, and I think that's ridiculous. I would honestly love to speak to someone in the industry who hates me, I think that would be interesting. And then I could ask them questions, as they could to me, and I think that would be healthy, but the sad reality is that if anyone on an opposing side agreed to such an arrangement, their colleagues and friends would see that as sacrilegious. And would likely think, oh, so-and-so is now against us because they decided to talk to Endymion. It's like with Grums right now. He's the Antichrist pretty much in modern video games, but why exactly? It's simply because he agrees with the players and asks questions, and that is clearly not allowed based on what the game dev side thinks. And speaking of Grums, Thomas and Philip decided to exchange words further in his thread and it's a little crazy how honest Thomas is with his opinions, here's what they said. Hey, you're arguing against cancel culture, but when I replied directly that I found that argument hypocritical, which I think is an okay thing to do, the tweet is taken to a now overall woke agenda and sent to 100k followers, don't you think that sounds familiar? To which Thomas says, and oh boy, I'm not in charge of how the internet works, Philip. I wish I were. That's why I told you to be careful. You're representing a big corporation, and if you end up saying the wrong thing, do you really think that corporation will stand behind you? You worked on Cyberpunk. You folks should have read 1984 for research. Holy shit, dude. Thomas with the truth bombs over here, and he's right too, because this whole exchange of words has been between two very different sides of the game dev bubble. Thomas and Moon Studios represents the indie game developer. They obviously have smaller budgets and teams, but also smaller amounts of investors, so less people to hypothetically answer to at all. 
Whereas Philip is at CD Projekt Red, which is a huge developer that has a lot of people that they have to answer to. And what Thomas is saying is sadly right. I mean, what Philip has done here is put himself in an unwinnable situation no matter what he does going forward. He either doubles down and keeps rejecting Thomas in order to appease his corporate masters, or he deletes everything and goes protected, which ultimately just proves that everything Thomas said was basically right and he has no argument against it. Either way, Philip is in his own grave where he can either dig deeper or lay down and die. Neither option seems very good, does it? And this is a big problem with the game industry. The fact these two men of two studios can't even speak without all of this happening is proof alone of how twisted this industry is. I know already some will say, well, now Moon Studios is like Grums. They're the enemy of the game developer or something. Or Thomas Mahler is now a grifter for saying what he said, but it's not true. You're not a grifter simply because you agree with the customer. And I think the fact many on the game dev side would unanimously agree that Thomas is now the enemy because of his opinion says more about them than it does about him. Also, why is agreeing with a customer considered a bad thing? Why is it grounds for excommunication and rejection if you objectively look at everything around you and go, wow, this sucks, we should probably change this? The only reason why what Thomas Mahler has said is being considered in any form problematic by anyone is simply because they know deep down in their heart that what he's saying is right. And these days, it's not really about being right, it's about projecting what is being pushed as the right way to think above anything else. Like Thomas said, 1984 should be mandatory reading for everyone and it's crazy how a dev who works at CD that made stuff like Cyberpunk of all things. A game where the entire world is dictated and controlled by a small group of uber powerful corporations can't see that. Like dude, it's right in front of you. You made the game. That's entire existence and themes hang on the concept of corporations controlling every aspect of your life. How can you not see the craziness behind this? I don't think Philip Weber is stupid at all. He's likely just another game dev that understandably realizes, like Thomas said, that he's simply a cog within the bigger machine. And that he can either be that cog in the machine or be replaced by someone else immediately. And he knows that he can't change CD Projekt or the company's ethics overnight by himself. I mean, we already know virtue signaling is hollow anyway, not just for CD Projekt, but all game companies and beyond. Just look at the profile pictures on any social media for CD Projekt. Of course they have the rainbow flag in every icon except when they market to the Middle East. If these companies actually cared about the stuff they virtue signaled about, they would refuse to back down and enforce those same imageries across the board, but they don't do that, do they? Because they change their opinions, ethics, and beliefs depending on the situation and demographic that they're dealing with. You could be doing an interview with a CD Projekt employee or really any Western game dev in a westernized culture and they'll say, oh yeah, we're totally for multiple pronouns and so on, we're all pro for all of that. And then you can take that same person, put them in an interview with a Middle East reporter and they'll say, yeah, we're against all of that stuff. It just proves that time and again these companies' morals fluctuate based on what's politically correct depending on where they're selling their products, it's all it ever is. So this is why whenever I see any company virtue signal yet they remove all of the wokeness from their games when releasing their products in the Middle East for example, like Insomniac did with Spider-Man 2 by the way, you just need to know that all of this is performative and none of it is genuine. And nobody in these companies actually believes in these causes and if tomorrow ESG was deleted from the industry and suddenly being super base was tied to a new ESG like meter that dictated their funding, all of these companies would throw their rainbow flags in the trash, pick up an American flag in an instant, and suddenly be pro-American if it meant that their investors would be happy and they would get funding and could sell their products. Because none of this, I repeat, none of this is genuine ever. This entire industry is being held together by years old duct tape and a bunch of guns are being held to their heads and backs as they dance and pander in hopes that they don't get destroyed next. And in that moment, it's exactly as Thomas Mahler said it would be, that they came for me and then there was no one left to speak for me, and that's what's left. These companies are eroding all the goodwill and safety nets that they hope that they're not next on the chopping block because they're far too deep to back out now. And they've effectively created an entire industry where everybody is lying to themselves and everyone is too afraid to speak out against it. Tell me how this is healthy for anyone involved. I'll answer that by the way, it isn't at all, whatsoever. And need I remind you, The Witcher Remake, which CD Projekt has okayed to be made, has already stated that they will remove outdated elements from the game. And remember, it's not because they want to do this, but because if they don't do it, they'll be turned into mulch by their peers. It's the for modern audience shtick as always, which is just corporate speak for we have no morals and we will do whatever is needed in order to ensure we're not blacklisted by the industry. 
And yet someone like Thomas of Moon Studio stands up and says, hey, this actually sucks and what happens, they come for him. If Thomas sticks by his ideals and doesn't bend the knee, his game will absolutely become a smash hit. I guarantee people will buy his game even if they're not interested, but simply on principle alone to prove a point. But now Thomas finds himself in a similar predicament to Philip and CD in a way as well. He has two paths to go. He either continues rejecting their nonsense and builds his company and developer into a studio that champions free speech and then basks in money and fan love. Or he caves in and apologizes and ends up making a game that will be made for no one, people will reject it on principle alone despite quality or not, and his studio will die. But at least in the eyes of his peers, they'll say, sure, Thomas Mahler destroyed his studio by apologizing and laid off people and ruined livelihoods, but at least he didn't have wrong think. And if you ask me, the choice here is simple. Stand defiant, stick a middle finger to the crazy people, and then tell them to go screw themselves. Those other devs, they don't pay your bills, and neither will the people who attack you anyways. There is only one audience, the same audience that's always been here, and if you ask me, Thomas, Philip, or anyone else, it's in your best interest to not attack or alienate the paying customer base if you want to keep existing. Because if you do, well, just look at Rocksteady right now and you ask them how things are going. But what do you think about all of this? Let me know in the comments below. Like, subscribe, share, and thanks to my patrons for their undying support. Have a wonderful day, stay based, and I'll see you soon.